we will move on to the consumer welding process, the second third unit, right, right, okay. So, in a GTAW, in a gas tungsten arc welding, it is non consumer welding process where the electrode is intact, at least it does not melt, okay. So, in a consumer welding process, the electrode melts and then the molten droplet is transferred to the base material and then we form the well bead by melting the, the work piece or the base material plus mixing the droplet from the electrode and the molten pool is solidifies, we form the well bead, okay. So, in the consumer welding process, there are lot of advantages compared to GTAW because now we can weld much larger cross sections in a single go because you add more material, okay. The other disadvantage, main disadvantage we saw in GTAW is process efficiency, isn't it? Because the, the heat, if it, the electrode is electronegative, the, the heat is absorbed by cathode, it is lost. Whereas in this case, in consumer welding process, that is again transferred back to the well pool, isn't it? Suppose if you QA is in a heat in the uh, uh, anode and QZ, that is a heat absorbed by the cathode. In a GTAW, this is lost completely in electronegative conditions, isn't it? So, only whatever heat is available in anode, it is what it is actually used, right? So, ultimately, we if you make conditions such a way that QA plus QC is transferred to the work piece, that means that efficiency increases, is not it? So, in the consumer welding process, this is possible because even if you have uh, an electronegative situation and the, 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 the electrode is absorbing the heat or the generated heat at the cathode is transferred back to the work piece and of course, well, you also have a QA anode heat generated and both are combined so that the efficiency of the process can be improved, okay. So, that is also in, in, a, in a practical terminology, the GMAW is much more efficient than GTAW because the both anode and cathode heats are transferred or to the work piece, okay. So, we will see in physics, so first we will see uh, an OV video, so we get used to the process, then we will go to the physics. How many of you have seen uh, GMAW? So, what is GMAW first? Gas metal arc welding, okay. So, what are the variants uh, of a consumer welding process? Can you name some? Submerged arc welding, very good. And then these two? Hmm? Flux code arc welding, very good. And then another famous, very commonly used low cost process. Hmm? Yeah, SMAW, what is SMAW? Yeah, shield metal arc welding or manual metal arc welding or stick welding, okay. So, these four are the most commonly used the consumer welding process, SMAW, SAW, what is SAW? Submerged arc welding, GMAW, gas metal arc welding and then flux code arc welding. Okay. So, we are going to look at each processes, these four processes, but not just processes, I always say that we look at the physics of these processes, okay. So, there are a lot of signs in these processes which control the stability as well as the arc stability, metal transfer, force balances, so that we can change the process characteristics, efficiency, heat input, arc energy and so on and so forth. And we will also look at uh, uh, in, a, in the flux code, flux based processes, the role of fluxes, okay, how are they going to affect the process stability and everything. So, since most of you have seen, not seen the uh, GMAW process, I will show you a video, okay. So, what we are actually doing it. So, what see over here is, so we I see two electrodes, in this case, I use two electrodes to make this video and we strike an arc between the electrode over here and the base material. So, the arc is struck, in this case I am doing a pulsing, 
okay. And during this process the electrode also melts by absorbing heat from the arc and then the molten electrode droplets are transferred to the workpiece. Okay, so, and the, the, the nature of the droplet, how we transfer, that determines the bead geometry as well as the process characteristics. For example, so in this case, it is like a spray, is not it? It is coming like an opening a tap spray, whereas here the droplets are transferred, individual globules, okay. And the characteristic of this transfer determines the stability of the, the pool. For example, in this case, you may have a higher productive process, uh, the uh, uh, melting, but if you increase the current even further, then uh, the, you may also change the spray into uh, some sort of a jet. So, in this case, uh, a globular transfer can also be made into ripple globular by changing the, uh, the current as well as the other forces and you may end up creating lot of spatter. For example, in this case, you see the spatter formation, is not it? So, when uh, the globules got exploded uh, once it enters the arc, say in some, some cases, you see this spatter is flying away, is not it? See again. So, these are all uh, some instable, inst uh, the unstable conditions. So, in this unit, we are going to look at the all the physical forces that are present during G GMAW like we saw in GTAW and we will also calculate how we can melt and what are the, the parameters that are controlling the, the melting characteristic of these electrodes, right. So, again, so we look at all the physics behind the process. First. So, the four important processes, gas metal arc welding, shielded metal arc welding, flux code arc welding and subversion arc welding. So, we will go in this sequence because gas metal arc welding is the most widely used in the welding process for engineering applications, okay. And the, the uh, uh, shielded metal arc welding, it is also used for uh, uh, low end applications but with large production uh, needs. And flux code arc welding also it is widely used uh, if you want to melt more and you, you will have to deposit more volumes per unit time. And submerged arc welding is widely used for welding thicker sections because the efficiency is so high, so you can, you can achieve a good amount of penetration because the arc is completely shielded, okay. So, the, the, the radiation and the convective heat transfer is minimized by completely shielding the arc. Okay, so, we will see one by one. The first is the basic equation, heat input and this is valid for any arc welding process, okay. Let us look at this equation in detail. The first question always arise, so what is the unit in the other side, yes. So, how do you define? So, these equations, hmm? so what is unit of V volt? What is unit of current I ampere? What is that ampere? So, you will have to recall my first lecture. And what is V? Which is speed, is not it? Right? So, then what is in left hand side LHS? What is that? Hmm? What is unit of heat? Joule. Joules per? Joules per? Meter. Good, because where we define is meter per second, right? Just a unit. Okay. So, LHS is joules per meter and RHS is, in, there is no joule in RHS. Where does joule come from? VI. So, how does VI become joule? Hmm? Power, power is joules per second. Again, where does joule come from then? From? From the work, exactly. So, that comes from the basic definition of voltage and current, okay. So, electron volt 
E V. Okay, so, the energy gained by the electrons <coughs> while moving over a unit distance. So, that is what the electrons gain the energy, joule. So, that is the basic definition of voltage and the current, right? Is not it? So, I, I taught you in first class when you define the amperage. So, one ampere is when one, one coulomb of electron travels in 1 meter, if they gain 1 or if they spend 1 joule of energy that is 1 volt, right? Or if they release 1 joule of uh, uh, energy when they are travelling from one point to other point which is kept at 1 meter interval, so then it is 1 volt. So, that is the basic definition of the voltage and current, 1 volt and the uh, current, okay? That is the work done by the electrons while travelling over a potential difference, right? Because they will have to work, so that is defined. So, the joule comes from the work done by the electrons while travelling over a potential difference. So, that is joules per second and here we have meter per second, the second cancelled out and then unit becomes joules per meter. So, we always supply a heat input when you define joules per meter and there is another guy here. So, why we put this guy? Efficiency, I already mentioned here, is not it? Yeah, so that determines how much amount of heat is transferred from the arc to the workpiece, is not it? I just explained in the previous slide Q A and Q C. In a GTAW, if it is electronegative, Q C is consumed, it is not transferred to the workpiece, is not it? The whatever heat is consumed by cathode, it is gone. So, that is why the efficiency is quite low. Is not it? So, if in a, uh, uh, the cathode also transfers whatever heat is consumed to the workpiece, the efficiency increases, is not it? So, if you want to calculate the efficiency, we need to look at again the heat generation in the arc. So, by looking at that, we can accurately calculate the efficiency, right? So, we will do that because that is important. So, th without that we cannot calculate how much heat you are actually inputting to the workpiece per unit length, right? So, if, if you do not use an efficiency and this is your arc energy, the energy is there in the arc, but all the energy is not transported to the workpiece, which is some of them are lost because of the inefficient method we use to transfer the heat. Right? So, how do we calculate the efficiency? There must be some method, right? Is not it? It is just, just some number. There are some people always say that 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 60 percent, 70 percent. But we, as a welding engineer or a welding scientist, you know, we should give some physics, physical background for this efficiency. Okay? Let us calculate efficiency from the basics. Okay? like we did it in uh, when you look at the energy transfer in the arc. It is very simple. So, what we need to understand is again the go back to the basics. So, in the basics what happens here? So, we have an arc column and the cathode uh, fault zone and anode fault zone. The voltages are not linear, is not it? Except uh, in the arc column, in the cathode fault zone and anode fault zone, you have a gradient in voltage. So, the, this is the basic for heat generation I, we were talking about, right? Because of this gradient in voltage, we have accumulation of charges, okay? So, the accumulation transfers the heat, is not it? In this case, if it is uh, in, in, in the, the electrode is an anode, okay, the electrons are transported to the anode and that transfers the heat. Similarly, if it make it is in, a, uh, in the electronegative, the electrons are transferred to the workpiece and that transfers the heat. 
by looking at this fundamental mechanism we can calculate the efficiency. So, how do you calculate the efficiency then? So, we always know that we have a three regions okay the one region is the anode fault zone and the other region is arc column and then the third region is cathode fault zone. Suppose if we know the heat generated in each three regions we can then using an, a simple heat transfer to calculate the efficiency okay. So, we can assume that imagine now your the, the, the consumable electrode or the electrode is a cathode okay. At the cathode what happens at the cathode when we look at what is the main function of cathode? Emitting. To emit electrons is not it. So, to emit electrons it also absorbs heat work function is not it the work function that means that it has to consume heat to emit electron is not it. And the moment the electrons are emitted and the electrons are sent to arc column is not it. So, when the electrons are at the cathode the temperature of the electron is the cathode temperature is not it. The once the electrons are coming out of the, uh, the cathode then they also consume heat otherwise the electrons will be in low temperature. So, once they go into arc column and they will have to attain the temperature of arc column right. So, they also consume heat is not it. So, if you look at the amount of heat present in the cathode or cathode fault zone is the heat generated at the cathode because cathode also has a current and the voltage which is V i is not it that is the energy produced in the cathode and then cathode also get energy from the arc is not it. The arc column also sends energy to cathode the total energy in the arc is V arc column times the current I, but not all the heat in the cath in the arc column is not transferred to the cathode right only fraction is not it. So, we have the fraction of heat energy transferred from the arc column to the cathode and these two are the energy gain in the cathode is not it energy produced at the cathode uh, fall zone plus energy acquired from the arc column these two are your credit the energy credit. But this energy credit is spent by two ways the one way is electron emission which is negative term right and the second term is to heat the electron to the arc column temperature. When the electrons are there in the cathode the, the, the electron temperature is the cathode temperature the moment electrons comes out then they also consume heat because they will have to be heated up ok. So, the, the heat balance at the cathode fault zone is the heat energy generated in the cathode energy acquired from the R column minus energy consumed to produce an electron minus energy consumed to heat the electron which is produced to the R column temperature and that is a 3 by 2 K the Boltzmann superstar ok that is the, the electron temperature and this is column temperature the so delta T ok. So, this is 3 by 2 K delta T divided by E. So, that is the, the equation to calculate the, the amount of energy needed to heat an uh, particle to a uh, temperature right. So, we, uh, we assume that so electrons consume the heat in two ways because the work function consume the heat and then when the electrons are heated up and then the electrons should be heated up to the arc column temperature that is also consuming heat ok. So, these four terms make the energy balance at the cathode fault zone ok and then now, now the energy balance in the anode fault zone would be plus terms 
okay, because the electrons ultimately reach the anode, is not it? So, now we have similar equation for the anode fall zone or the anode that means that that is a heat generated at the anode and then the amount of heat transferred for the all column to the anode right and then the gain from the electrons is not it the electrons ultimately reach the anode whatever heat is consumed by the electrons will be gained in the anode is not it. So, your question is answered. So, whatever it is consumed by the electrons would reach the anode right it is clear. So, you already see where the temperature will be high where the temperature will be high in the anode is not it. So, that is why when you keep electronegative ok. So, anode will be work piece. So, the work piece will always be in higher temperature than the cathode is not it because of this balance. So, that is what when you are doing GTAW if you are keeping electrode positive the cathode temperature the, uh, the your electrode temperature will be higher than the work piece. So, that is not good for the stability of the electrode is not it because according to this equation when the electrons reach the anode they also carry heat. So, whatever they gain in the cathode is transferred to the anode is clear. So, it is so that is why so when you are welding so you always we always try to make sure that the work piece is anode. So, that is the efficient process. So, that we can attract the electrons the electrons bring the heat from the cathode and the R column to the anode yes it is clear. So, now the efficiency so efficiency is now based on the polarity is not it how do you calculate for the non consumable electrode when the electrode is positive. So, electrode positive means the work piece is negative that means that work piece is cathode is not it. So, that means that from the anode nothing is coming. So, only the heat whatever is available is Q c is not it. So, efficiency is nothing but the Q c over V i. So, V i is, is the overall your i and then voltage. So, Q c by V i times 100 percent V i is the, the total energy available in the system over the Q c times 100 is the efficiency is not it it is not efficient process is not it Q c cathode is always at lower temperature. So, if you make work piece a uh, negative a uh, cathode that is not efficient because you are losing heat somewhere electrons are not reaching right. So, if you use the DC straight polarity or electronegative your work piece is Q a that means that the heat energy will be maximum because all the positive terms the electrons would also whatever the work function the work function it gained whatever temperature it gained in the R column would be reaching the anode the efficiency will be higher right is clear right and then we can calculate Q a and Q c by using these terms. So, if you know the the arc uh, the cathode falls on voltage and the i is the the actual E ok and then similarly the uh, arc column voltage work function we know we know k what is the arc column temperature electron temperature you know and we can calculate now the efficiency very accurately right. And for AC alternating current it is an average because you are changing the polarity every cycle yes is clear and the consumer welding process. in both DC and AC does not matter because in this case whatever Q c is generated is transferred back to the work piece either it is a, a electronegative or positive. So, whatever the if it, the consumable is an electronegative 
you melt and again you are sending it back to the anode. So, the efficiency is Q C plus Q A together is not it it is clear and V A is the, the overall the energy ok it is clear and this is how uh, we calculate the efficiency of the process when you are doing in a heat input calculations right it is clear. So, now according to these equations which is the most efficient process? Conventional welding process is not it which is the least efficient process. So, when you have non consumable with reverse polarity where you make your uh, the electrode positive right it is clear. So, in the both the cases you know this is not efficient GTAW because in any one of the cases if the, the electrode is not transferring heat what is consumes it is not efficient is not it. So, that is why when you calculate the efficiency GTAW in ele the electrode positive case <coughs> you have a least efficient efficiency. The maximum efficiency comes from a submerged arc welding process why because this factor becomes close to 1 is not it because this factor gives the fraction of heat transferred from the arc column to the anode or cathode is not it. So, this factor if it becomes 1 the entire heat generated in the arc column is transferred to the either anode or cathode is not it. So, that term takes care of the heat transfer from the arc yes it is clear. If this is close to 1 that means that whatever arc column heat is there it is transferred to the anode and cathode. In submerged arc welding the arc is closed. So, the fraction of heat transferred from the arc column to cathode anode is the maximum. So, this term the C A and C C becomes close to 1. So, the efficiency increases to very high amount. So, if it becomes close to 1 it will become 100 percent efficiency because this is a consumer welding process. So, we need to add both Q C and Q A in that the fraction of heat transferred from the arc to the anode cathode also maximum. So, that is why it is very efficient process yes it is clear. So, we calculate we can calculate the, the C terms by using an, 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 an spectro, spectroscope spectrometer and we can identify the efficiency of the each processes. So, you see the in plasma welding also we also enhance the, 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 fra, the factor terms by constricting the arc we maximize the heat transfer from the electrode to the work piece not the other direction because plasma jet transfers the maximum heat to the work piece yes and uh, the, the, the silver metal arc welding and GMAW will have equal the heat transfer in the silver metal arc welding it is slightly higher because the fluxes also generate insulating vapor layer. So, they that protect the arc from radiation Okay, so, the efficiency increases because that factor term increases. Is clear? Any questions so far? So, it is a simple heat balance. How do you calculate the efficiency? So, it is not a simple like a term you use 50, 60. So, there is a physics behind it. So, when you are using a heat, heat input equations, yes, it is clear? Good. We will move on further. Okay, so, quickly we will go and then we will calculate in a consumer welding process using the same principle we can also calculate melting rate because that is already determined by the heat balance. So, melting rate of a consumable. So, how do you calculate? So, what is melting rate? The mass of electrode material melted and transferred from the electrode to the work piece per unit time. We, we looked at the video right. 
So, how do you make sure that you know uh, you have the NF droplet transferred per unit time? So, you can play around voltage and current and then calculate, is not it? But there is a, a, a fundamental way of calculating that from the heat balance that just I taught you in QC and QA, right? Let us do it and then we look at in detail the equations. So, melting rate we define as a mass of electrode material melted and transferred from the electrode to the workpiece per unit time. If, if you want to calculate the melting rate of wire, you need these two parameters. First parameter is latent heat of melting of the wire. Second term is the energy required to increase the temperature of the wire the droplet which is already formed to the droplet temperature, the wire temperature to the droplet temperature, is not it? So, heat of the heat is needed to raise the temperature from the wire temperature to the droplet temperature. So, these two would be consumed, is not it? So, what is available? Which heat is available? Latent heat is available. Okay, so latent heat and the and these are all consumed. Where is the energy supply coming from? Where, where does heat come from? Arc, right? Okay, so that is either QC or QA, isn't it? Isn't it? That takes care of cathode heating. Okay, the amount of heat is coming from the arc to the the cathode right and then work function and then temperature consumed by the electrons. So, that is the heat is available either Q C or Q A and the additional another heat is also generated in this case if it is wire. So, that is joule heating is not it. So, now the melting rate is nothing but these positive terms Q C plus joule heating right minus latent heat of melting okay so that you can say h minus and then the energy required to heat the molten metal to the droplet temperature so which is nothing but dt minus tm times cp right if you know these we can calculate the melting rate right and what is q i q a is how do you calculate joule heating is it i squared r exactly what is r okay how do you calculate resistance rho l by is not it right it is clear so, we have you know equations for Q C and Q A, we have equations for Q I, we know H, we know this if you know specific heat capacity. If you know all these four, we can calculate the melting rate, is not it? Yes. So, simple Q A is suppose assume your consumable is an anode, what is Q A? So, we can take I out because I is common right, the current is not it. So, it becomes now the voltage in anode, the amount of heat transferred from the arc column to the anode and then this guy the work function energy gain by the work function with the electrons and then the energy gain by the electrons by the heating up from the, the cathode temperature to the arc column temperature and that is I and this is joule heating. And these terms added minus latent heat of melting minus your Cp specific heat term that will give us the melting rate, is not it? So, melting rate we can get the relationship now and M. So, if you add all these 4 and balance the equation, 
So, you will get the i term, i term comes from the QC and QA and then the other term we get that is from the dual heating. So, L i square by pi r square and A and B is now it is a constant. So, for example, this entire term is fixed for a given process. Suppose if you fix your electrode polarity, you make the electrode in anode, right? Given a shielding gas, the, the efficiency is determined already, okay? For a given process condition and this is fixed, it is clear? Yes or no? Because I is, we already taken out I because I is a variable, is not it? And this is material constant, material specific constant, this is again material specific constant. So, now if you look at these equations, what is the important variables is current and then L and then R. A remaining else is constant for a given process and a given material composition, is not it? So, the melting rate of a consumable is determined by the welding current. If you change the welding current, melting rate changes and the other two important parameters, the R which is the electrode diameter. If you increase the electrode diameter, melting rate decreases. The other parameter is L. What is L here? Length of the wire. In welding case, we call that length as a stick out length. So, what is stick out length? Suppose if you have an, uh, your CTWD or the, the electrode, the length of the wire which is sticking out from the contact tip. So, this is known as contact tip. Okay. And then you form a arc here and this is the work piece. And this length L is known as stick out length. So, if you increase the stick out length, what will happen? Melting rate, melting rate increases. So, for a given process condition, so if you fix the shielding gas, okay, then you fix this, is not it? If you fix the shielding gas, the heat generated in the R column is fixed, right? And if you fix the material composition, then H is fixed, C P is fixed, this term is fixed. <coughs> Right, and if you fix the the seat, uh, the, uh, uh, the electrode composition, the work function is also fixed, isn't? So for a material given material composition and given shielding gas, and A and B are fixed. So then the the variables which can be controlled to change the the melting rates are welding current, stick out length, and then the consumable diameter. Okay. And if you fix the diameter also, that means that this also goes away. So, there are only two parameters can be changed independently, they are stick out length and then welding current. Yes, it is clear. So, if you fix all other things, shielding gas is fixed. Therefore, the R column heat is fixed, material composition is fixed, therefore H is fixed, C P is fixed, is not it? And then now you fix also, also fix the welding electrode diameter, so R is fixed. So, what are the two parameters can be changed to change the melting rate? The welding current, stick out length, right? And in practical cases, we play around this these two parameters to get good sound well beat characteristics. We change the stick out length and welding current for a given electrode, 
diameter composites. So, when you buy an electrode diameter, so you, 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 you plan to weld a 3 mm thick and uh, say a 690 steel and you have an equal similar filler and you, you are establishing the process parameter. Okay? And then you need to now calculate the melting rate. So, your composition is fixed, you are buying a 1.2 mm diameter welding wire, your diameter is fixed and you are going to use argon as a shielding gas. So, all other parameters are fixed. Suppose if you want to establish the welding procedure, two things you can vary is current and then stick out length. Yes, it is clear? It is good. So, with this we will we'll finish this class.